Hi, Mike. Uh, on behalf of Amicus Brain Innovations, uh, thank you for joining us again today in this conversation. Um, so we had a very emotional conversation on um, November 2nd and uh, appreciate your sharing um, your uh, um, story with us, you know, your being a caregiver to your um, wife, Rebecca, um, who was diagnosed with early onset. Uh, I, I cannot imagine it was, uh, it is something that uh, is very difficult. That's, uh, you know, to be diagnosed at the age of 45 and then um, your son was only six years old. So you talked about the diagnosis and the, that itself was difficult because you don't want to think about Alzheimer's for a young person. And um, yes. so, so that was a process um, and uh, it took a while and to get a confirmation that it was indeed Alzheimer's and then um, getting informed about the disease and uh, preparing and planning, you walked us through that. And then um, through the various stages, the different challenges that, that, uh, that came, um, initially uh, you took care of her at home. She could be at home and she was somewhat independent. She was able to drop off your son um, at school. And then um, in the later stages, uh, at, at po on one point, um, you had to uh, take the help of a daycare center and you had to drop her off even though she was not very happy about it. And um, so these were all difficult decisions that you had to make, uh, but your, your, your love for her and your son and, and the commitment came through in all of these decisions. You know, you had your other priorities um, because you were, for you, the situation did not come after retirement as it does come when it um, affects someone much older. So you, you still had a job to go to. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, with the pandemic, that brought other challenges. And um, you had to make the very difficult decision of um, uh, placing her in a facility. And then um, she passed away last year. And um, very sorry that you and your son, Lucas, have to go through that experience. And I'm very appreciative of the fact that um, you have been very openly sharing this with us and also through your many articles that I have um, read. So what I thought um, we will do today is um, I have learned most of my lessons about dementia from other caregivers. And I probably true for you too. We were both part of a support group. Um, so I now share my story with many people and there are other caregivers who call me. And while I, while I don't sugarcoat it, I don't tell them, oh, it's all okay. You, you got this. Remember you wrote something about you got this and people tell you got this. Um, that is not true, it's not easy at all. But it, it doesn't, ha it's not um, just that. That is one aspect of it. Because when I look back, I, I look at my, uh, I have memories with my dad that I created with him, this new version of him. So over time, I learned to relate to my father as this new person with this uh, loss of memory, but he still had many things left with him. So maybe, and I think that is generally true. Um, so maybe we can talk about some of those things in a way that it can um, give other people hope because we both got through the journey. You know, we got through the journey and we did all we could. And with, uh, we took care of other priorities and we took care of ourselves. Um, we sought help from people. And so we learned a lot of things in our journey. And um, so maybe I thought that we could um, do that in today's session. So, um, I mean, do you want to, you know, start by sharing something, you know, of how, what were some of the, you know, what, what did a day look like with your wife and um, also through progression, you know, what did a day look like and how did it change through the disease progression? Yeah, I mean, and early on, you know, Becky did not really want to think about her disease. Um, it was better for her. I mean, she always lived in the moment. And, and uh, um, you know, I would joke for, with her that, you know, she fell out of a tall building, she would just enjoy the ride home, down without thinking about the stop. Because it just, it was, it was in her nature. She would always be very much in the moment. I was almost the opposite. I was, I, you know, I was a planner. And, um, but I think for the, the caregiving experience, that's really, you probably need to take the opposite. You need to take more, more of the momentary perspective. Um, 
one of the things if you know I kind of learned along the way, um, I'm not a very patient person, and you need patience to to get through this. Um, there are a lot of things that you don't do well, and and what you have to do is you you have to forgive yourself and move on when you make mistakes. Um, on a day to day basis. Um, one of the lessons is that our loved ones need to find meaning in their lives. Um, you know, if they have a dementia diagnosis, they may have only a few years left and you can't control that. You can't change that. Um, but they still have each day and they need to make something of it. They need to, it needs to mean something to them. Uh, they need to have a purpose. And, and so they want to be able to contribute, whether it's to the family um, doing chores, whether it's for the community, um, whether it's just making someone happy, they need to be able to communicate and to, to uh, contribute and, and to make meaning of their lives. And, and um, Becky always tried to find ways to do that. Um, I didn't always understand at the time, but she was, she was finding ways to make her life meaningful on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's probably the lesson that, that, you know, both, both patients and caregivers could really learn is, is each day, make it, make it, make it meaningful as, as, as you can. I, I think uh, that you bring up a great point. Uh, we had our support group meeting today, actually, and someone did uh, talk about this and uh, he had tried different things with his father. And he said that um, one thing that finally worked after trying many things is um, the attendant that is taking care of him um, he asked his dad, you know what, he doesn't know um, English or I don't know, whatever it was. And he really wants to learn and it'll be great if you could teach him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he felt uh, a great uh, deal of passion for that. And he felt like he had something to offer uh, mm -hmm. someone. So that became a thing, a routine now. Um, so, you know, they always talk about routines, having routines for um, um people with dementia. Um, so the way I looked at routines was I did, I did a lot of things intuitively. I hadn't read a lot of uh, things, but uh, it made sense to have a routine, but it was more a sequence of things rather than, oh, it, ha it had to happen at 10 a.m. because uh, approximately, yes, my dad would have, a ba have his bath at a certain time and then followed by, I had certain rituals, like he would have, I would give him a glass of juice and you know, then we would uh, sit together and uh, talk or watch TV and listen to some prayers. So we had a routine, but uh, over time that changed. So my thing is ha have a routine, it helps, and then do things in a certain sequence that helps, but be prepared to change and be prepared to be flexible. So did you have uh, routines uh, with Becky? Yeah, I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, as things moved along, especially in when she was going to the adult daycare center, um, you know, we'd have a regular routine. We would get up. I would, if I could, I tried to do uh, uh, a little bit of time on an elliptical machine because getting a little bit of exercise was helped keep me sane, um, keep me a little bit healthier. And then um, we would get going, get a little bit of breakfast, get, and then get the routine, get to her daycare center. You know, they had a very structured plan each day, um, a calendar that they had set out. Um, and then, you know, each evening I would pick her up after work. I would, um, take, you know, take her and, and we would pick our son up from school. Um, we would come home, make a simple dinner. One of the things I learned along the way is, is to simplify things whenever you can. Um, and so, um, because we had, you know, so much responsibility and their, their, you know, dementia introduces a lot of chaos into your life that, I try to make things as simple as possible. Um, try to make really simple and small meals. Uh, you know, we would make, you know, some sorts of protein and one a vegetable and some salad or something. Um, and then we would, you know, just watch TV for a little bit and, and uh, um, read a story with our son before bed and, you know, evening routine and, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. On the evenings, we went to a lot of movies. Um, simply because it was something to do, it was a distraction. I think one of the things that was really difficult for Becky is, is there was a lot of anxiety along the way and the anxiety really built up if she didn't have anything to do, if she didn't have something occupying her. And so um, finding something to do on the, on, the, on the days, 
And so when she was going to the adult daycare, you know, they would, they would fill up her day with things. But on the weekends, um, we would, um, you know, go to a movie. We went to a lot of bad movies because it didn't really matter what we were going to see. It just was something to do with the day. Um, get some lunch or we would have lunch with a friend on the on Sundays very often. Just finding that structure and finding finding that something to just occupy your time, um, knowing you have a purpose, even if it's only for the next hour, knowing you have something that's that you're you're getting done. So were you able to do that all the way to um, the pandemic when you know you couldn't go out much and all that? Because um, as a disease progresses, sometimes we're not able just to take her to uh, take someone to a movie, and then you have to be careful about how the movie would affect them, and because they start imagining things. Yeah, the pandemic changed things, of course. Uh, uh, you know, for us. In, in March, we, things shut down quite a bit. Uh, the movie theaters were closed for, I think, about a year. Um, and so there was a lot we couldn't do. And that is, I mean, and it, and it really coincided with her entering pretty much the final stage. She was getting into, you know, what we kind of informally call stage seven of the disease. Um, she was having mobility problems. At that point, she, it was more difficult for her to do some of these things anyway. Um, there were some things we were still able to do, like go and get groceries. Um, but after a certain point, even that became too difficult because I did not feel comfortable taking her out. Um, she was falling down some and her ability to navigate a, a grocery store or um, even keep with me while we were there. And so, you know, I got a, a meal delivery service toward the end. Of course, and then we were concerned about the, the um the virus as well. So trying to stay in. And so her anxiety ramped up during that time. We had some structure and then I was trying to get, I was still working during that time. I was trying to work from home, but that, yeah, that was, and then, you know, the stress built up at that time, partly because she didn't have the structure that she used to have. So it, it did, the pandemic did really make a, a big difference in that. It, it did mess up, mess with our routines. So um, one of the things a lot of people talk about, uh, it came up again in the support group meeting today is um, keeping them busy with activities. You know, that's always something that, how do you keep them engaged? And it's different for different people. And um, I, for me, there was times when my dad um, would be just quiet and he would not be doing anything. And I thought that was okay because it's impossible to keep someone engaged all the time, you know? And uh, I mean, what do you do? And also their attention span is not very, it doesn't, it's not very long. Um, and there are recommendations that you don't, you know, give them an activity for a very long time because they get stressed out and that causes other problems. So did you have that uh, to have to deal with that? That, you know, did you, oh, what did you ever worry that? Okay, now what am I going to do with 10 hours or something like that? You know, how do I keep her engaged? Yeah, there were there were times, and I think that's when her anxiety would build up. Is is if we didn't find something for her to do. Um, to be honest, a lot of it really came from her. She found the activities herself, um, and she early on in her disease. I mean, she was finding ways to keep herself busy and and something occupying her. Um, she still loved to do certain things, and and she wasn't able to do everything. She would, you know, she lost her driver's license fairly early on. And, um, and so she wasn't able to go out and do things with friends as much as she had before, but she got into artwork. Um, of course, she, she still loved to scuba dive and do things like that um, and, and visit with her friends. Um, but she would, she would make meaning of the day by, by doing artwork and, and occupying. And so that lasted um, through probably at least 2018 or, or close to it. And that helped a lot. And the anxiety that would build up when she didn't have that for some reason, when it wasn't available to her, I mean, we could see it. Um, and I, you know, I wish I could say I found things to occupy her, but she actually did it herself more than I did. And there, there are books, there's, a, there's one book I believe called Creating Moments of Joy or something like that for the Alzheimer's patient. I have not checked that book out, but I hear good things about it. It's probably, I think things like crafts and things that you can do. Okay. The thing that to really be aware of, of course, is 
what goes first is not the long-term memories. What goes first is the short-term memories. Yes. And so the, your dementia patient will usually have very little short-term attention span. And so they may not remember what you did 30 seconds ago. And so you, I mean, having a lot of patience, being willing to repeat things in, with any activities you do, um, being willing to just go over, you know, and do the same thing over and over again um, would be a, a good strategy if you can do that. So um, I want to come back to, come to repetition because that is another issue that people face. Um, um, but uh, since you mentioned art, that was one of the things that um, kept her engaged. It's a good time to talk about your article that I read, Art and Alzheimer's. So do you want to talk about that a little bit and maybe share some of her art? Sure. And, and I, you know, I just pulled up one piece that we could share, but one of the things that, that she started with early on, I mean, she was knitting, um, a friend had helped teach her to knit. Um, and she started making, um, little hats for people, um, knitting hats. And she, she had the idea that she was going to have a knitting business. Um, and our sister-in-law put a few of the knitted hats in a, on consignment in a, in a local store. I don't think very many of them sold, but, but, um, it was going to be a knitting business and it was something to keep her busy. Knitting didn't last a really long time, honestly, because um, I, she didn't ever say it to me, but I think she said, it. you know, when, after you get to a certain point, um, counting becomes difficult. And I, I did notice the hats were kind of getting big. And so, um, you know, some of her family has big heads, but it, like these are getting even bigger than your heads. So the hats would be very big. And so, um, but after a while, she kind of gave up the knitting because I, I think, you know, when, when you have little short-term memory, counting becomes difficult. But she got into artwork and um, she started with these uh, adult coloring books, you know, these coloring books that are made yes. for, for adults. Um, and she just, she, and she loved color. She had, she had dabbled in art occasionally. Her mother had, an, uh, uh, had majored in art a little bit. Um, when, when she was in college, she dabbled in it a little bit, but she had never really done a lot. Um, but somehow the, the dementia seemed to open something up um, and uh, either removed some barriers or opened things up in her brain that she approached it a little differently. Now, one of the things is it, it does place some limitations. You can't, I, I guess the way I would put it is, is, you know, she had the artistic sensibility. She probably could not really think through and plan a piece. She would do a lot of things in pencils and pens and vibrant colors. She called herself a colorist. And she would, she would plan things in, she, she really couldn't plan a, a piece out. But what she would do is she would start drawing squiggly lines and each corner of a piece would make, and so she would, uh, there would be little creatures would, would come into it, uh, whether it's a moose uh, or, uh, sometimes the, the the sun or different things, but they would be within these pieces of with lots of squiggly lines. I'll just share one of them. There, there are many of these that she did at the time. Um, and so this is just one that I had the time to pull up. And a lot of times, you know, it's a lot of vibrant colors. She, um, early on, she had our son uh, naming some of the pieces. And so this one he called Howling Wolf Flowers. Wow, and so um, I don't know that there's any repre anything represented here, but there's just a lot of uh, different, you know, shapes and lines and things. And then yeah. sometimes she would build things into them, um, whether it's a different creatures, like, a, like I said, a, a moose or a, uh, a, a tree. And there would be, sometimes there would be, you know, foreboding creatures, like um, some really scary looking creatures. Um, trees and things that would come into it um and she would, would build something like this you know some of these would be like maybe a a, a day i mean oh, it, wow. this was this way you know this because she's not at this stage able to plan things out she's just drawing each piece at a time and so maybe she does something okay the corner of it will look like this and then we'll just put this in the other corner and then somehow it all kind of came together um, so it's not the way it would have been a few years before when she did not have dementia, where she might've been able to plan something out and have a structured piece or something like that. We could really watch what I, what I wrote about because she was in the later stages. 
um, we could really watch how the, the, the diseases of progression on the brain affected her artwork along, work along the way. Um, eventually they got um, more, less complex, they got simpler, um, then they got smaller. And so what she would do is she started making bookmarks and she would make, uh, you know, these small bookmarks, probably have some right here. Uh, she would make little bookmarks. I don't know if you can even see this. And so she would draw things like, you know, there'll be, a, here's a sun and some, uh, you know, rolling hills and a few things. And she would make bookmarks and she could make dozens of these in a day. Um, and it just, part of it was really occupying her time. But another part, I mean, this gave her a sense of purpose because she could share them with people they, and, uh, yeah. you know, help bring, you know, have some Actually, impact on the wor world. Um, one, of, one of the things that, uh, you know, that you know, I came to appreciate later on, um, we would go to a restaurant, say a little sandwich shop, and she would just sit there while we were waiting for our food or whatever, and she would draw a bookmark just during that time, and then she would just walk up to the to the counter and present it to the cashier. And the cashier, sometimes they were flabbergasted. They really didn't know what they were, what was going on. She, but she gave them a gift and they had a bookmark. Um, and I think sometimes they didn't even know exactly what was going on. After a certain point, you, you know, they could tell something was wrong and they might've just thought that she had some um, cognitive challenges, but you know, unless they asked me or unless we knew them, they wouldn't know. But I know that at least one restaurant, they kind of had these pinned up on the wall, you know, because uh, they would bring this. And this is, you know, it's something that, that helped occupy her mind all along the way um, and helped give her a sense of purpose, a, a sense of meaning um, along her journey. Um, I think um, there's something about art. Um, I think you said that... Uh, I think it removes the inhibitions. Dementia probably removed some of the inhibitions and she was able to express yes. herself more easily. And I've, um, this one lady that I knew from one of the support groups online, um, she used to share paintings of her father and her father never spoke. He, didn't, he, start, he had stopped speaking, but there were beautiful paintings and apparently he never used to paint. Mm -hmm. And um so suddenly it, there's this burst of uh, expression uh, in a different way. Um, so it's uh, art kind of is able to bring something uh, or give them a way of expressing themselves. And when they lose their words, you know, you know that was one of the things that she lost. And yes. I also heard in one of the podcasts about art and uh, Alzheimer's where they, uh, people with dementia were asked to just draw anything and it didn't matter and then one old man he hadn't said a word in a long time and he wrote he drew um i think a fork and a knife and two wine glasses or something like that and it was him imagining that uh remembering his wife uh, uh and with, with him him on a date with her or something like that you mm -hmm. know so they are able to express uh some memory uh of, you know thought through this art. I think yes, it's really, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So um, I want to now talk about, uh, you kind of uh, probably already said it, but um, specifically the question is repetition. We need a lot of patience and I struggle with it. I'm not a very patient person and I, I ended up in, the, in this role of a caregiver. And um, so um, one of my friends is actually dealing with this problem of constant repetition and they don't know it's about okay uh how do i change update my top, um bank statement i don't know my name on the bank or something like that and it's something it could be anything and over and over and over again and then gets agitated so i know you had to deal with repetition um how what did you do i know they say distract redirect you know what did you do yeah and you know, probably the, the biggest thing is, is, you know, of course they, they realize, or I, I, I guess I shouldn't say that because there, there really seem to be a couple of categories and some, some Alzheimer's patients will go through the entire disease in complete denial. They have, they really believe there is nothing wrong with them. And then they start to get into this conspiratorial, everybody's acting against them because there's nothing wrong with me. It's, it's other people who are doing things. 
and that can be a real challenge of its own. I kind of had the opposite experience with Becky because what she she noticed every she was aware of every loss. She could feel it. She could see that. And so one of the things is, you know, but when you when you're repeating yourself, you don't know that you're repeating yourself because they literally do not remember that 30 seconds ago they said the same thing. Yes. And so um, one of the things I tried to learn and it was a really slow and gradual process and I was never perfect at it, but I tried to just not react, not, you know, keep your face blank, um, not say any, not, just not react as though she's already said the same thing. Um, and- But did you just, have to give a response? If you answer, yeah. If you, you if you've just answered response. a question, then you answer it again and you answer it again and you answer it again. And, you know, and, and then sometimes in the midst of that, you can find something to distract them to, to get something else, you know, get their attention somewhere else. Sometimes they will obsess over a certain thing for hours on end and it can be, it can drive you, you know, to distraction. Um, but, you know, luckily if, you know, I think you just try to develop and try to keep your face blank. Don't, you know, don't react in any way if you can avoid it and just, you know, just, you know, answer the question again, answer the question again. Um, one of our favorite, or, you know, my favorite moments along the way, um, our son had a couple of the, the little neighbor girls over playing with them. And, and the little girl who lived next door was aware of my wife's diagnosis, I guess, by that point. And there was the other little girl was uh, from down the street was not aware. And uh, Becky, at one point or another, repeated herself or asked the same question that she had just asked before. And the girl who didn't really know what was going on, she just kind of looked up and gave a, you know, didn't understand what was going on because this was a strange behavior. Yeah. They'd both known her for a, for a while. And then the other girl just, just kind of looked up and very casually said, oh, no, she's, she's like Dory from Finding Nemo. And um, we tried to find some fun in that wherever we could. Because, I mean, as long as you're not um, poking fun or belittling a person, then you have to find yes. those little moments um, when you can enjoy what's happening to, and, you know, you can, you can uh, oh. uh, make light of what is happening because, you know, there are a lot of dark moments. Actually, um, in a strange way, for me, that became a positive thing. I mean, not the, uh, um, an aspect of repetition. Um, because there were, my dad was much older. He was uh, close to 95, 96 when he mm -hmm. passed away. And um, there, were, there was very little I could do with him. You know, uh, basically it was conversation, holding touch. I used touch a lot. Um, so actually we expressed, I got really close, close to him because in our culture, we don't really, um, we are not very demonstrative physically, especially in you know, a father and daughter. And uh, now in the present generation, it's probably changed, but um, we, I was always hugging him and kissing him and he was giving me a kiss that had never happened all my life, you know, mm -hmm. all of that. But then, and um, there was very, uh, he had macular degeneration. So he had lost uh, most of his eyesight. His hearing was really bad. Mobility was, uh, close to zero, uh, at that point. So, but I, he, and he had very few memories, you know, long-term mm -hmm. memories. So I kept, it was the same joke. So repetition helped me because I could walk into his room Oh, there was joy too, because I would, I, these were my favorite things. I would walk into his room in the morning and I would just wait for his smile. Some days were bad, but a lot of mornings we could just look at me and I was this new person every time. He didn't recognize me. So every time I watched, he was naturally a polite person. So he would just look at me and give me this beautiful smile. And he would say, I would say good morning. And he would say good morning. And five minutes later, I leave the room and I come back again. Uh, in a few minutes and again it would be the same routine and I would get that smile again so that repetition it had a positive aspect to it and also we would uh, laugh over the same jokes I didn't have to come up with things to engage keep them engaged because it, I could use the same thing over and over again same song we sang mm -hmm. the same song together um, so that was very helpful because I didn't have to go re google and okay what what's new he's going to be bored today if I tell him the same joke no, I could tell him the same joke. Yes, my wife was a musician and sometimes, I mean, they will sometimes say that music will bring a person to life in ways that other, and sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. Sometimes she seemed to have no reaction. 
but there were times we would be driving down the road and and certain songs would come on not even songs that she had loved or or remembered a great deal about but she just would would start singing along and really enjoying it and you 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 enjoy those moments um one of the things that i found also um our son you know like I, we mentioned before he was six when she was diagnosed and so this it was it was pretty rough on him but there were times i mean as things progressed of course he had to grow up very fast and he could see um certain aspects and he could see when i was close to the end of my patience and he could jump in and, and he learned to help out at, at certain times and he would come in and just start teasing her in a in a very um fun way um you know my wife uh, was 45 when she was diagnosed and of course she turned 50 um as she was approaching the the last year what would be the last year and so he you know she, when she turned 50 he would start joking with her about oh now you're old and you know and they would chase each other around the house and things like that little things that that, that kids do um yeah. that you know those are the one among the few positive memories that he'll have but for her, those were the those were little good moments that that yeah. she could have with him. Talking about the age thing, for me too. Um, I was just watching. I recorded a lot of these. Uh, I, that is another thing that helped me, and I recommend that to people. You know, when you have these moments, capture them on video. Or I started recording them uh, like it's a video diary for me, and I had a separate Facebook page. That's why, because I didn't want to think about my grammar and all that. I could just like have a place where mm -hmm. uh, candid moments. And uh, I was just watching this video the other day where I'm asking my dad, how old do you think you are? And, uh, you know, I could ask him that. And he was in a good mood. And he said, I said, oh, you, you, I think you're 95. I usually help him. I give him a question that's not too challenging. And then, uh, then I help him. I said, mm -hmm. 95. He said, no way. I'm not 95. And he, he really didn't believe he was 95. Sometimes he has said he's 2,000 years old. I mean, it's just oh, wow. a lot of it. And then he has also said he's 20 years old and he sometimes he didn't believe he was married and there were times he knew he was married. And then I said, are you think maybe 50? Then he said, yes, 50. Then are you 60? Said 60. So finally he settled <laughs> on that. I said, well, you're 60, but your wife is 90 years old. And he said, no way. I said, well, we need to get you a new wife. You know, she's too old for you. You're only 50 years old. How can you live with a 90 year old? I'm going to find you a 45 year old woman, you know, and, you know, we would have like silly moments like that and he would just laugh. Um, so mm -hmm. that was, so what I want to convey with this is, um, and also your story, but um, your son Lucas too, is, you know, it was, it is not the end of their life or our life with them. We can still have light moments of joy and we can laugh with them and connect with them in many different ways. Right. We just have to be, we have to get creative and, I think over time, if we shift our focus from the misery, you know, it's hard, that is there. But if we try to connect with them and, oh, I want, you know, do things differently, I think we can have that, those moments. And they kind of help us too, mm -hmm. you know. I used to look forward to them. And, and where you can, if, I, if I could tell the one story that, about the, the dryer. Um, along the way, one of the things that, you know, I, I know I, I, I learned even more that I was not a patient person and I was not good at that staying in the moment, but I tried, you know, and this is toward the later ends. I didn't really know how late it was, but it's, this is a October probably of 2019. And so my wife was, was probably in late stage six, you know, getting close to stage seven. At this point, she had lost most of her vocabulary. She didn't speak a lot. Um, she had only a few words that she would say. And, you know, there was a lot of anxiety and a lot of difficulty. And each day, I mean, we had gotten a new washer and dryer and they were in this little laundry closet in the hallway. And each time we would walk by them, she would, she would point at them and ooh. And, and at this stage, and she had lost so much of her cognitive ability, I don't know that she even knew what they were. Um, but I decided to, you know, try to change my perspective and I would have a little bit more patience. And so... Um, and I decided to record it. And so I set our, um, our iPad up on the dryer and I had her take the clothes from the washer and put them in the dryer. And this is something that I probably would have normally done in about 30 seconds. And, you know, 
it had been a couple of years really that she had not helped with housework because it would always be a frustrating experience if she's trying to wash it. She would put, you know, dirty dishes in the in the drawers or in the cabinets or she I mean, she did not understand any of the steps and it would be a frustrating experience for both of us. And I had not learned enough patience to just let it happen the way it needed to happen and let her do whatever she needed to do and be in that moment. And so I decided to just let things take however long they take. And so it might take me 30 or 45 seconds to put the clothes from the washer into the dryer. But I decided, you know, just I'll record it. I'll let her take as long as she needs to take. And so she grabs the clothes from the washer and puts them in the dryer. And sometimes she takes the clothes from the washer and she tosses them behind the washer because she didn't know what was going on. She didn't understand any of it. Sometimes she th threw them behind the washer and I had to retrieve them. Sometimes she grabbed the clothes from the dryer and put them back in the washer. Um, in all that took more than six, something like six and a half minutes, I think, for her to get the clothes from the washer into the dryer. And then I showed her the button to push to get the thing started and she pushed the button. At that point, at the end, I mean, she was literally jumping for joy at how ha happy she was. <laughs> I wish I could say that I had a lot of moments like that, that I did those along the way. But when you can find those little times to make your loved one's life a little better, <clears throat> just for a few minutes, then yes. that's what you have. And I think that's probably, if you know, one of the things that I, I see and, you know, occasionally we would see in the support groups is people would be, they would be in denial perhaps, or they would be looking for way, they're trying, they're looking for a cure um, and there is no cure. They're looking for some treatment that will delay things. And it just, it isn't, it isn't available. And you're, you're, you're harming both your own experience and your loved one's experience. And you're making it worse by trying to find things that aren't there. And so what I would say, you cannot control what is going to happen with this disease. You cannot control what it's going to do to your loved one and what it's going to do to their brain. And unfortunately you cannot control, you don't have any control over the eventual outcome. We all know what it's going to be. And it is, you know, it is heartbreaking for all of us when it does happen, but what you can have some influence over is their moments, their day-to-day -day experience. And <clears throat> try to make each of those both for yourself and for your loved one, try to make those the best they can be. And that's, that's the, you know, the best advice I could give anyone because um, you can't, you know, what you can't control, you just, you have no, and, and the, the time you waste trying to worry about that is time that you could be spending making your loved one's life better on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, um, you know, for six minutes, my wife had purpose and she had, joy and she was able <clears throat> to accomplish something even though she didn't know what she was accomplishing she didn't know what a washer and dryer was but she was happy and she had a purpose and she was helping the family and for that moment she would you know we had found something positive and so that's what i would say is is find that for your loved one find those little moments as often as you can when you don't find them when you fail forgive yourself and move on because they still need you. That's, that's a beautiful moving, um, you know, ex experience that you shared with us, um, that you were able to um, give her that moment of joy. And it is something simple. If you analyze it rationally or intellectually, oh, you know, she was helping you, but that, I think that everything becomes profound. I think in a way it's beautiful. It's, that's what happens, right? Something like a, uh, loading the um, dryer or something like that, the dishwasher or whatever.